be here, and even more so to be have become recently part of this uh, global health community. Um, the day Susan Gallagher presented me with a baseball cap and a t-shirt, I knew my life had changed forever, <laughs> and, uh, in all very good ways. And um, gosh, it's been another, uh, I have to say this, it's been another kind of violent and heartbreaking week, and um, it's good to be in a community or an institute which doesn't, uh, which stands for all of the good things in the world, and for globalism and, and, and caring. So that's just my momentary reflection on what's happening around us. Um, as, as you just heard, my work is about how we communicate with patients and their families. And I have to take you uh, for just five minutes into the sort of theoretical basis of this stuff. And then we're going to travel around the world and look at different ways that this is, I've been able to teach or learn about communication skills in a, a variety of different low and middle income countries. So it all started with uh, this book, in my opinion, which is a very meticulous uh, uh, work about of conversation analysis, and now analyzing conversations between doctors and patients that came out in the 1960s or 70s. And uh, I teach a global health focus course, and as Asha knows, this is like the, this is the centerpiece of the whole course. And the kind of conclusion that came, uh, that came out of this book is essentially uh, talking about there being two different worlds, and that um, the voice of the life world is what patients and their families understand, which is everyday life, experiences, events, financial problems, social problems, the burden of living with chronic illness, either in an advanced country or a low- and middle-income country. And then on the other side is the voice of medicine, which tends to be very scientific and technical. And uh, there, no matter where you are in the world, I think that the task of communicating between those two voices is enormous. And then, depend, and then, if you're in a, if you're communicating across cultures, or with uh, limited resource, uh, a system with limited resources, that those barriers become even more enormous. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. How does one help healthcare providers overcome those barriers? So I'm going to show. So when I when I teach this stuff as over as sort of as an overwhelming overarching metaphor, I ask the learners to imagine that you start out on opposite sides of a table. Uh, imagine you start out on opposite side of the table from the patient with the problem in the middle, and then asking the question, um, what would it take to be on the same side of the pa a table with the patient, looking at the problem together? And that's the whole. That's a summary of the entire thing. So I, I want to show you a very brief video from my work in the United States to give you a cultural context uh, that's our own to get a sense of what I'm driving at. So um, uh, I was hoping Mike Hadlin would be here because he's the actor. Uh, he and I created a series of videos for neurosurgeons, or I should say neurosurgery residents, and how to communicate living bad news and uh, getting surgical consent and... Uh, dealing with disappointing outcomes. And I'm happy to say it's become a national course for neurosurgery residents in this country, and it's, it's still happening uh, for every resident uh, at some point during the term. So I'll show you kind of this video. In the video, our teaching method was to show like a bad video and a good video. So I've shortened all of it into a kind of compressed version of the bad followed by the good. Uh, you're not going to, some of you who are not involved in medical field day to day may not believe the bad one is believable. So you'll, I'll have to tell you that the neurosurgeons thought it was perfect. So you, you know, <laughs> nobody felt it was exaggerated. And the good one kind of speaks for itself. So here we go. Mr. and Mrs. Jones, I'm Dr. Anderson. I'm the neurosurgeon. The pediatricians called me because uh, Junior had an MRI scan. And it looks like the MRI scan shows a brain tumor. Um, I looked at it myself and uh, it shows a lesion in the cerebellum, tumor in the cerebellum that we're going to have to deal with. So we checked out my hour schedule on the way up here, and it looks like uh, Tuesday afternoon we can do the surgery. Are you sure you were talking about the right? Uh, yeah, little Jimmy, about four years old, I walked by his bed when I was coming up here. He was still just coming out of the MRI scan. Well, we, we thought he had the flu. I mean, he just had some nausea. And, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, sometimes these brain tumors can... Uh, push on the back of the brain, and where they push can cause nausea and vomiting, and sometimes it mimics, well, no, it's not the flu, it's a brain tumor. 
So we set up the surgery for Tuesday. Um, the uh, pediatricians will come in and tell you what Betty's going through. I don't know what Betty's going through yet. We're going to keep in the hospital till Tuesday surgery. Looks like it'll be in the afternoon. Any other questions? Hi, Mr. and Mrs. Jones. I'm Dr. Anderson, the neurosurgeon. It's nice to meet you. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what's been going on with Jenny? Well, well he's, he was sick last week, just <coughs> last week, and you know, throwing up and headaches and just really intensely sick and just not kicking it. Yeah. So we know there's a flu going around, so yeah. we just want to make sure it wasn't anything more serious. Yeah, it's worried about his immune system. And then they, they went out. through an MRI here, so yeah. it's been, they said they're holding out. But He's been gone for four hours on the way. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you, you've uh, you've been sick for about a week and throwing up and headaches. And I know you've been waiting a long time. I'm sorry about that. They have, they have to sedate him a little bit to get the whole still for the MRI scan. Is he scared? Is he okay? He's okay. I just saw him, and I was I, he's uh, basically like waking up from a long nap. So he's moving around. And he looks fine. He's opening his eyes, but he's still not trying to back to his normal self yet. The nurses are watching him really closely and everything's fine with him. Um, I looked at the MRI scan and uh, I'm afraid I have some bad news for you. It looks like he's got a brain tumor. Yeah, I checked very carefully the scan and him, and it fits with the symptoms he's having. And he's got a small brain tumor back here in his cerebellum on the right side. I just thought he had to, you know, we just thought I was funny. We, we thought it was kind of silly me that came that day. Sometimes these present that way. People, the, the little kids are sick and they're nausea and vomiting, but it turns out it's actually pressure on the back of the brain that's causing them to have the headaches and that kind of thing. <laughs> this is really a shock. I just, I'm 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 just, i is he going to be okay? Or? He's going to be okay. We're going to be with you every step of the way. Um, do you mind if I tell you a little bit about the plan going to be, what we're going to what the next step is, so we can keep taking good care of him? So the, I can tell you one thing. We're looking at the MRI scan. So those are the kind of skills we uh, try to teach. And um, there are skills that are teachable and learnable. So in my opinion, uh, most healthcare providers uh, have have the capacity for empathy, but often don't know the words to express it. And so when we teach courses to medical students, residents, providing, uh, practicing physicians, midwives, nurses, uh, they're all about giving um, providers the, the skills uh, to communicate uh, with empathy. And um, it turns out that uh, even though, it turns out that in the United States, this has become sort of standard practice in every medical school in, in the country to have a course in how to communicate with patients and their families. But for a variety of reasons, and in Europe more or less, and but for a variety of reasons, it's not so much the case in low and middle income countries. And uh, the, the situation that doctors and patients face is not terribly different, which is to say that half of the work of a doctor, in my opinion, is how we communicate with patients and their families. And it's not intuitive. And if there's not a course to teach it, then uh, it's, it may not go well. So I began to imagine, uh, after 10 years of doing, creating videos of this type, what it would be about to, to create a course in a medical school in, uh, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa or in Ethiopia. And so, and Ethiopia. And so I started to look at various possibilities. I was able to get a Fulbright to work in Durban. I had a brief uh, experience uh, creating, helping to create a course in Botswana and then uh, later in, in Gondor, in the historic uh, northeast of Ethiopia. And it's been a journey uh, where I've learned 
I probably learned more than I was than I taught, and <coughs> but there were some wonderful collaborations and some I think reasonably good results. Um, <coughs> my starting point was this uh, man there, Joseph Butelesi. Joseph is the Joseph leads two lives. He is the caretaker or sort of janitor in my mother-in-law's apartment complex in Durban, and he's also the head man in his village, uh, where he where he engenders a lot of respect. And he and I kind of sit down once a year and have tea, and he asked me about what I'm doing. And when I told him sort of my overall arching concept of the Fulbright project I was doing in Durban, he said to me he knows exactly what I'm talking about because when he goes to see his favorite doctor, he feels like he and the doctor are singing the same song. And I thought this is a much better metaphor than being on the same side of the table. Uh, much more poetic, much more African, much more musical, much more everything. So that's become the theme of my focus course of my, about everything that I do is about singing the same song. So then um, there were a couple of other sort of uh, aha, aha moments in this process of my imagining uh, facilitated the creation of medical school courses. And a big one was in Botswana. I was having dinner with a pediatrician who told me that when he wants to know, when he wants to ascertain if the uh, patient's mother, if the child's mother, has taken the child to a traditional healer. He asks simply, how is the soft spot? How is the fontanelle? Because if he asks directly, in many cases, the mother will feel hesitant to give the correct answer. But it's a code in the sense that the mother knows that that's the, that that's the part of the body the healer focuses on. And by asking that question, it opens the door to the answer, which is usually yes, but not always. And then you can find out also what the healer recommended. And at that moment, it dawned on me that, in fact, the task of creating a course in a place like Botswana would be to accumulate this wisdom and turn it into a curriculum. That every, every country is so specific with respect to the words and gestures that communicate empathy and help us to get information that you'd have to just really sit down with people who know and, and who know the language, the culture, and medicine and then make this happen. And that's been my kind of dream goal plan uh, ever since. And so, uh, and it varies enormously. In Kenya, um, I, I, I did a focus group with a bunch of uh, patients in a clinic, and uh, we were sitting in this town, sort of in the marketplace, and uh, I was kind of naming all of the skills that I routinely teach to the residents, like you saw in the video. And the one, I, I mentioned a few, and then I said, what if the doctor said, I'm sorry you had to wait so long today? And it was instant excitement. Like this would be the most amazing thing that a doctor could say, given how long everybody's waiting and nobody seems to care. So that was an easy one to incorporate into a training manual or a curriculum. And then finally, when I was up, I was doing some work at a AIDS um, home health care center in Ikopo, South Africa, called <coughs> Rosamoya. And the uh, health care workers there have a very low rate of turnover and a remarkable high level of job satisfaction. So we studied... Uh, we studied what it was about the culture in that center that created uh, such, such fulfillment. And one of the things we noticed is in the, uh, when, the, when the healthcare workers had their monthly meeting, they would sit in a circle, and each woman would talk about her accomplishments and her challenges. But more so, after every woman spoke, the woman sitting immediately to her left would say, would say back to the group what she had heard. And it struck me at that moment that if there's anything universal in our desires in terms of healthcare, it's maybe this desire to know that the doctor was listening, to know that we've been heard. Uh, the technique we use here is to kind of simply say back what you've heard to the patient, which often has a, uh, for the providers in this room, that often has a, a remarkable impact, and you can see it happening in that very moment. So that was kind of some of my... Uh, thoughts about medical school courses, and I didn't mention Ethiopia very much, but that was the most exciting in, in some respects, because the university pulled together a committee of anthropologists, sociologists, psychologists, and doctors to create the foundation for the course, and that was exactly what we needed. And so I think that in future, the collaboration with social scientists is, is very critical to this mission for two reasons. One is because they can speak accurately to the culture and the language. But something else that I wouldn't have imagined, which is that the anthropologists and sociologists were like patient advocates. And the reason for that was simple, that the doctors treat each other like VIPs. 
So no doctor ever experiences the health system as it really is. They, you know, they make house calls to each other's houses. So only the anthropologist knew what, what happens when his mother got sick that he could explain to us how bad things are and how much they needed to change. So that was a, a, an unexpected benefit of involving everybody in this process. So um, I'm going to, about uh, three or four years into this work, um, I, I actually um, was contacted by somebody at FHI 360 about the, the concept of doing some work around respectful maternity care. So it's become, as most of you know, this has become a worldwide issue that's a big focus for the World Health Organization. And it pertains to the way women are treated during childbirth. And there has been identified a number of ways in which, in which women are often uh, neglected and abused uh, during the birth process. Uh, yelled at, uh, hit, uh, uh, verbally abused, uh, not given privacy, not allowed to have a birth companion present in the room. All the things that make transform childbirth into a miserable experience. And so there, around the world there's also been an attempt to respond to these worries by creating uh, various curricula in, in respectful maternity care. So I've done this on two different continents. I'll briefly mention my work in Chile, because it was different in so many ways, and then focus on what I've been doing in Ethiopia. So the work in Chile is in a very small uh, university in a very uh, relatively small city in the south of Chile in Patagonia. And um, the course, I was asked to create a, a brief course for the midwifery students in how to communicate uh, with empathy. And so um, I'll just say in advance that uh, midwifery in Chile is a complicated story, uh, and as is obstetrics in general. Because Chile is one of these countries with an astronomically high rate of cesarean sections. And nobody seems to know, agree, no, no, I wouldn't say no. Nobody seems to agree upon why. So the doctors make up a story, I think, that this is what the women like, want, prefer. And uh, there are many different versions of reality. But the fact is, the rate of C-sections is way beyond what is medically indicated. To the extent that this has been uh, termed by the, uh, the activists who are trying to change this around, and also make this a more respectful process in general, uh, Call this violencia obstetrica, which is obstetric violence, which is a very loaded term, but I think accurately describes the way they feel about the experience. So, and the problem is that the midwives don't have very much power, and so they're kind of at the mercy of the obstetricians and may not have any way to affect this reality. So, we created these respectful maternity care workshops uh, for students, and uh, the students are all uh, local. They're all from that area of Patagonia. So they brought a lot of their own life uh, story to the classroom. So we asked them first to reflect on their own experience as patients or when family members were patients because there had been quite a lot of suffering just based on the, un the extent to which this is so underserved, this part of Chile is so underserved by the entire health system. And then we showed them a, series, a, a single video of... Uh, from a website uh, about a, a website from an organization that's fighting against obstetric violence, and uh, it was a video of a, te a testimonial of uh, a woman talking about her experience in a public hospital where she was treated really abused. And um, I'm, I'll, I'll come back to this theme in a few minutes because the the use of testimonials as a vehicle for teaching, to me, as I've just been. I've just begun to understand how profound that is. And I don't have this testimonial to show you, and actually it's only in Spanish. But basically the story is very, it's about three minutes long, and it's, it's strong, it's very, very strong. And then I just asked the students to reflect on their impression. And one of the students kind of summarized what they were all feeling, I think, or many of them were feeling, which said it made her feel triste y rabia, which means sad and furious. And I thought, hmm, that's a very, that's, that's a pretty good combination for what we're trying to accomplish. Because sad alone is not going to change anything. But sad and angry might actually be the beginning of things, uh, of transformation. So then we actually discussed essential communication skills. And we had a wonderful local actress who helped <coughs> us do role play. So we actually were able to practice some difficult conversations uh, with the actress. And it was just... Um, it was very exciting to sort of have this course in its first iteration and see how well, how well the students responded to, their experience, to the experience. So now I'm going to switch continents and talk about Ethiopia. So I, I, I ended up 
with an incredible stroke of good luck, which is that after I visited FHI 360, I was subsequently contacted by Pierre Barker, who is the international, runs the international section of Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And for those of you who don't know, IHI is based in Boston, and it's an organization with a very large um, amount of work in the United States, but also now in several low and middle income countries that has to do with quality improvement in healthcare. And so uh, they had already uh, launched a national cooperation between themselves and the Ministry of Health in Ethiopia. <coughs> and I was just fortunate to kind of arrive when it was all in place and all happening. And so uh, I'm, I'm, I've been trying, I'm trying to arrange a way for a <coughs> to come speak here in, in the spring because he can explain the method much better than I can, but it's really extremely inspiring. Um, it inspired me because uh, when I started to learn about the respect for maternity care literature, all I saw, with a few exceptions, was study after study that documented and described the problem, and so little about affecting change. It was mind-boggling. And, and, and for me, who's relatively new to global health, it was just a revelation how much time and energy we expend in just documenting things without, uh, without any idea of how we might change them. And so by contrast, the, uh, this project is really about quality improvement. And it's based on a method uh, that, it, that <coughs> is about identifying a clear aim and how are you going to measure the improvement, uh, beginning with small tests and then testing them over a short period of time, meaning a couple of weeks. And then you refine the tests, you, you assess their success, and then you broaden and, ramp and scale up as you go along. And so every uh, one of the innovations and, and the curriculum that I'm going to be talking about in a, mo in a moment has been through this process and is now becoming part of a national curriculum in the entire country for midwives and health extension workers. And uh, we're, about, we're in the process of studying uh, and writing about the results because we have lots of data <coughs> based on what quality improvement has actually happened <coughs> at the hospitals that we're doing the work. And that should be done, I hope, in the spring. And come back with that in the future. So I'm going to take you through the course that we that we do for the midwives and health extension workers. And imagine this is a room of about 50 or 60 midwives, health extension workers in a, in a particular health district. It may include also the hospital administrators and uh, directors. And it's about a two or three hour session. But I'm going to give you like a condensed version of it. First of all, I have to recognize the team. Hema Maga is a, a uh, a uh, pediatrician at Harvard School of Public Health, who's also the country director for IHI in Ethiopia. Abi and Berkati are both physicians in Ethiopia that work for IHI. And Kadest is a Duke undergraduate, who some of you, I imagine, know. And she has been a phenomenal force in this project. She has done so much good work as here at Duke, and also she worked as an intern in Addis for the summer, helping to create the videos I'm about to show you. So that's an enormous credit to her. She's really a, a star, and her ability to speak Amharic and get to work on four buses every morning is <laughs> indispensable. So we, we start out with this notion that respect for maternity care is a human right. And then uh, we talked about testimonials. So now I'll show you uh, one of the testimonials. So the testimonials are going through various phases. The first set of testimonials, I'll be honest, were filmed in the living room of my our house by my wife Rhonda, who's a film Rhonda Kovansky is a filmmaker, using local students portraying the uh, the women stories and their and the stories were true. And then this past summer we recreated the uh, videos using actresses in a much more kind of slightly more sophisticated way. And I'm going to show you the original videos only because they have subtitles and you can understand what's going on. Unfortunately, the second iteration there are no subtitles and it would just not useful. So here's comes uh, here, here's one of the videos, and based on a, a compilation of true of true stories. Yeah. I'm here um, I'm just gonna So Genom när vi såg de avancerade perioderna, och när vi såg de avancerade perioderna, så såg vi att det var en 
ወልከን አማቺና አዋራጇ አጥስመሙ ግን የዴና ኤክስቴንሽን ሰራተኛ በውሳኔ ተስማማች ልክ ምጤ ሲመጣ ወደ ጤና ጣቢያው ሄድ ኮይ እና አንድ በሚገፋ ያለ አዋራጅ መቶ ሆዲን አጣመጣ ከዛ በኋላ ነርሷን ተራትና ይሁን ነገር እየተሻሻሉ ነበር ከዛ ሁለቱም ታይዱና በጣም በደንቃሪ ተመለከቱ ከዛ በኋላ ልጁ በቀዶ ጥገና ሆስፒታል ይጂ ሞለድ እንዳለ ተነቀረ ነገር ግን ለእና ልጅ ሞለድ እንዳቻልኩኝና ቀዶ ጥገናው እንዳስፈለገኝ አነቀረኝ እብጋን ታወራችሁ በጣም ደረቃቁ ናቸው እዚ ያለው አውራጅ ግን የሚያርቆን የሚያቃይ ስለም ያን ብሎሱ ሙሉ ወጭ መሸፈን እንዳለብኝ ስለማቀ እና ደግሞ ብዙ ገንዘብ ስለላይ የወጭ ነገር አሳስቦ ይነበረ ከሌሊት ሆስፒታል እጂ ባላቀ ግን ዲው ቦሪ ሰማ በጣም ውድ እንደሆነ አቃለው ግን ስለዛፈኝ ስለብሩ በጣም ይቃልፈለው ነበር እና አውራጁ ፊል ላይ ማክማማት ሲያይ አሁን ሆስፒታል ማን ሄድ ኮነ ለጁን ደግሞ ስለሚቀር ስለዚህ በቃ ላይ ይሰራል ከዛ ማውራሱ ሁለት ሰዓት ነው ቀይቶ መጣ ይሁን ለመጡ ማን የተጣደፈ እኔ ለሞሰድ ተራቴ ማክሶን ነበር ከዛ በኋላ ላንድ ሰዓት ሙሉ ኮሮኮን ቻይ ከተባዘን በኋላ ለኔ ሆን ደሞ ሰዓት በጣም በስቃይ ሆኒ ሆስፒታል ደረሰ አምቡላንስ ውስጥ መቀመጫ ስላነበረ ባይ ያን ድራይ መሳጫል እንዴ እንደምን አባላቀም እዛ ሆስፒታል እንደጋይ ብሎ ነበር ይቆስ ለኮ ሲካሉ ጋር ስደስ አንዳንድ ሰዎች ተነጋገሩና ወደ ወርጫ ክፈል ወሰሩ በጣም ቃል ስለነበርኩ ምን የ ምን የሆነ እንደነበረ ብዙ ማቀባይ ነበር አንድ ነጭ ኮት ያረቀ ሰው መጣና ዶክተር ይመስለኛል ፋይናይቶት ለነርሷ ነርሷ ፈልላክፈል እንጆስቱ ነው ፕሬሽን እንዳደርክ ተዛ ሳስተራለፈ ግን ኦፕሬሽን ማለት እንደም ፈልክ ወይ እንደም አፈል ከይፈቃራረቀኝ ነበር ሊክስ ነቃ የኔጂ ዩት ኢትራፍ ወይ ኢትራፍ ምንም አንቀ ነገር አለበት በሰዎች ይህን ተነበሩ ምንም አንቀ ነገር አለበት ከዛ በኋላ ዶክተሩ መጥቶ የኔጂ ዩት ታረፈ ነገር ከዚህ ማልፎ የልጥፋት እንደሆነና ቶሎ መንካት እንደነበረ ቢፖስታሉ ከዚህ በፊት ደግሞ ገዘመኝ በደም መከታተል እንደነበረ ይነካል በሚቀጥለው ቀን ካውስፒታሉ አሰጥቶኝ አሁን ካዘኑ ችምር በሩን እየሰቃየው ነው ለሪሰቡቺ የተፈጠረው እንዴት እንደመረጋቸው አሮቅ So this is um not a typical story but it's certainly a true story and from my own experience uh, just observing on Trinity Ward at one of the large uh, public hospitals um it was just it is a terribly sad situation uh there's no privacy uh in this particular hospital all the family is required to stay outside of the building for the entire process so the women are essentially alone and um that and that was just and then the communication that was happening between the providers and the patients did not seem good because i never saw a woman smile in the whole two days that i spent on that journey so just it gives you kind of a mental picture of what that whole thing is like and we actually used these we had three testimonials and we used them to just engage the learners in a 
a process a, a process of reflection <clears throat> because uh, just by humanizing the the patients the women giving birth uh, it, it seems to be a very important first step to creating a connection and a caring on the part of the midwives and health extension workers who may be frustrated overworked uh, tired and um, and having a very hard time as well. And so we, we asked them to write about each uh, of the videos, asking the questions, how did the woman's story make you feel? Uh, what did you learn? And is this relevant for your, for your facility and for you personally? And those are the three questions we kind of uh, asked them to reflect on, and then uh, we speak as a group about our, our reactions to the films. And the interesting thing that happened in the course of this process is that the Health extension workers, who are the ones who are kind of the lower part of the totem pole, uh, really came to life and started to take a much more active role in the process, uh, in, the learning, uh, in the learning process. So then we actually have a discussion in small groups about uh, the healthcare profession. Uh, um, sort of what made you think about becoming a health provider and how does it compare with the way things are in your life? And it's just a way of getting people to, getting the uh, providers to think about the quality of their own professional life and how they, how maybe they had strayed from their original intent to be helpful and, and caring towards uh, patients and their families. And after that, we just uh, tried to explain uh, the concept of respect for maternity care. And it has to do with uh, these kind of um, World Health Organization dictated uh, criteria, uh, which is about information and informed consent, uh, companion, confidentiality, dignity, freedom from discrimination, and right to continuous care and attention. And this has been translated into Amharic, so it's available uh, through the World Health Organization as a poster and as brochures and so forth and so on. So we try to um, we try to at first present an evidence-based uh, view of what is the <coughs> what is the current situation in Ethiopia, and it's based on a number of the studies that I mentioned that 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 did measure the severity of the problem. And also asked the question, uh, why do women prefer home births? Because to date, uh, despite the fact that uh, the, the government is advocating for hospital or facility-based births, <clears throat> the vast majority of births are by traditional birth attendants at home, often in areas where if there is a neonatal emergency, there's no way to get to the hospital in time. So it's kind of an automatic uh, fatality. And so uh, we, they kind of asked the question of the women who are still giving birth at home, well, why have you decided to do this? And the major reason was simply the uh, poor quality of service and disrespect that women were experiencing uh, at the health centers. And particular quotes that uh, I'm afraid of delivering there, they don't allow my family members to accompany me, they leave us alone on the delivery couch, and everybody who comes in and out of the living room watches our naked body, which is quite embarrassing respect from health workers. I won't have these problems if I go to a traditional birth attendant. I go to the health facility only as a, only as a last resort. And then uh, a look at the kind of care itself in, in, a, in particular centers in Addis, which uh, among other things, the provider didn't introduce himself uh, or ask, did not encourage me to ask questions, didn't explain what's being done uh, throughout labor and birth. Uh, no updates, uh, there was no consent for procedures, as you saw in this story. Um, no curtains or visual barriers to protect me, and uh, lack of politeness and intimidation threats or coercion. Uh, they didn't encourage me to call if I was in pain, and they often left me alone. So those would be the kind of things that were reported, and very similar to what I witnessed in several hospitals um, while, during my stay there. So then the question was asked, what would evaluate women? And this is all part of our presentation. So we're trying to set the stage for change by <coughs> giving you evidence of what the problem is. And so then we talk about an evaluation that was done by the Ministry of Health about what would motivate women. And uh, they wanted to have more choice in delivery, um, choice of birth position, uh, more, to experience more empathy uh, in the, in the um, birthing environment. Uh, this is a very Ethiopian request, but a very, very, uh, very strong one, which is coffee and porridge ceremonies. So, the end of uh, at, after a happy birth of a young a little baby, 
the, you have porridge and you have a, what, what Ethiopians call a coffee ceremony. Now, I take it back. They don't call it a coffee ceremony. We do. <laughs> because if you listen to a conversation among Ethiopians in Amharic, it sounds like blah, 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 coffee ceremony. Blah, blah, coffee ceremony. <laughs> and when I ask them, why is there no word in Amharic for coffee ceremony, they explain to me that actually it doesn't ex it's just coffee to us. We don't, we, don't, we don't think of it as a ceremony. So, but in fact, that's the thing that I'm describing is what was wanted and lacking at, at the health centers. And um, family support, which is kind of critical. Uh, and so then we talked, so we, we created some quality improvement projects that were around the issue of privacy and the issue of birth companion. So that hospitals decided uh, as a group, or the midwives at a hospital <coughs> decided as a group that in the next month, six weeks, they were gonna actually afford privacy to women by putting up curtains or invite birth companions into the delivery suite. And they were going to measure that result and then report back. And so there was sort of a very particular goal that's, that could be assessed. And if it hadn't happened, one could go back and try to figure out why. And that's that whole process of, of continuous quality improvement that seems to work so very well. So that was the one piece. And the second piece was about particular communication skills. Sort of the Ethiopian version of the neurosurgeon but I hope much more rooted in the culture and language of, of the country. So actually, we, we started out with the equivalent of the bad video. And this is a video we actually filmed in Gondar when I was creating a course for uh, medical students. And I'll show you that first. Oops. <laughs> So we actually watched this video as a group and discuss what was, what went wrong and what could be improved. And then we've started to create a series of videos that show a better kind of communication. So unfortunately, we don't have subtitles to this one yet. So I passed out, uh, we passed out some the script. And you, you can follow uh, the, this, this brief segment of the video, <coughs> the short, the first short, is the beginning of the script, essentially. And when you see things in capitals, those capital letters, those are the, going to be the subtitles in the film that identify the skills that are being used, just we, as we did in the neurosurgery film. Mm -hmm. 
saya lagi ini sekali Alhamdulillah Mungkin Mata-mata Kita tak saya Ia macam berencik Kita Berbunyai Kita Salah Dan berdua-dua Kan Kita Dibagi Kita Tinggal Berkata Kita Berkata Kita Berkata Kita Berkata Kita Berkata Kita Kita Berkata 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 Kita Tak perlu yang sama yang sesuatu. Sebenarnya kita nak semua tak kira kita tu bersekolah. Jadi, jadi tu mahal lah bukan? Kita nak kerja dalam sesuatu. Institution kan tu lagi tu nak yang macam perlu kita nak kerja dalam sesuatu. 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 Jadi jika semua ini tidak berjalan dengan baik, ia berjalan dengan kasar. 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 Ia in labor and inviting, and the midwife inviting the birth companion to be present and helping her to help the mom uh, with, the, with uh, having her baby. So we created these, these alternative videos to suggest what empathic communication looks like. And then we just go through the skills, and I'll do that a little bit quickly. But we ask the, uh, we ask the midwives and health extension workers to introduce themselves and create a partnership uh, and these are all in a teaching, learning manual that they take home with them. Uh, start with a very open question, uh, not a checklist, and try to listen and not interrupt. And these were all suggestions that were generated by the Ethiopian uh, physicians and midwives. Um, so I, I think it's all, they're all authentic improvements in the quality of care in Ethiopia. Uh, then ask specific questions after that, if necessary. Um, Make sure your patient knows you're listening by saying back what you heard, like we talked about before. Uh, recognize and name the emotions that the mother is feeling, whether it's worried or frightened, uh, and, and validating those emotions. Explain about what you're going to do in simple language. Uh, See, so if it's a cesarean section, you want to put it in words that are understandable uh, to the mom. And then at the end, uh, what questions do you have? specific. Okay. So um, basically, uh, we sort of summarize the communication skills at the end, and this is in a, a, a laminated card that the midwives take with them to try to remember to do these things. And um, we suggest that childbirth will be a better experience for women. Uh, you'll enjoy your work more. And women will choose to come to the health center or hospital instead of giving birth at home, and this will save lives. So I would just conclude uh, by saying, uh, I, I sometimes wonder if this whole area of patient provider communication is a neglected area in global health. To what extent are some of our projects falling short of the mark? Because we haven't guaranteed that the clinics in which we're working are friendly, welcoming places that patients and families want to be. <coughs> and what are the ways can one use communication skills to save lives? And I'll point to one study that was one of my favorites which was a study that was done by two uh, speech pathologists in, uh, in South Africa. And it was a study asking simply uh, teaching pharmacists to ask patients to, after they receive retrovirals for the first time from the pharmacy, to say back to the pharmacist how they understand they're going to take their medicine, to, explain, to just simply explain back to the pharmacist. And they found that adherence went up, and this is something that definitely a, a, a small communication team technique to save lives. So I'm going to stop there, um, and I have a short video to show you about another project if there's time. But let me stop and take a few questions, and then see if we have three minutes at the end. Questions? Yeah, in front. So I'm actually curious. You know, you did say that some of the providers <coughs> shared the improvements that they thought that they could make, which made you know, them genuine. Um, but at the start of these relationships and you teaching these courses, how was this information received? Just because I you know with the first video you asked how people feel when they see it, you know, 
watching it, I felt like sad and disturbed and really angry for this woman. But I imagine you can't just walk into a clinic and be like, this is a disturbing interaction. Like, you know, how is this just received that this improvement is needed? Um, because some of the behavior is quite abusive. And I imagine it's difficult yeah. to walk into a scenario and be like, hey, this can be improved. Right. That's a really, the question is, how do you kind of, uh, how do you introduce these very painful videos without kind of offend, uh, yeah. offending people, mm -hmm. offending the midwives and the health extension workers? Mm -hmm. It's a really good question. I think, let me just say that from the start, this is not done at the beginning of the entire <coughs> process. This is learning session number three, which is to say there's always already a trust relationship, we hope, between the learners and the, and, and, and the, and the, and the trainers. And so I think that helps a lot. I think that um, it's hard to say. You know, I'm, I'm so outside the culture that I could be totally wrong. But from what I gather from my colleagues, I think it's received with uh, sadness and recognition and then sort of hopefully transitioning for desire to change. And, and the women working as midwives and health extension workers may have a very valid complaints about their working conditions that make, make it very hard to spend time doing all this stuff. And that has to be part of the conversation as well. As long as we welcome that piece, uh, I think it goes well. There are studies and projects that seem to really blame midwives for the problem in a very, in a very unpleasant way. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think you get into huge trouble. There's a hand way in the back in the corner. Yeah. Um, I have a question. <coughs> One thing you mentioned was how some providers don't have the right words to express empathy. Um, and I wonder when you when you look at how they lack these words, do you think it's a combination of uh, sort of systems processes not giving providers enough time to ask the right words? Or if it's also an empathy deficit, and if it's both, um, does the sort of speak treatment change? You know, so, so I guess I would give an example. If I um, if I didn't have time in the in the duration of a session to ask really nice questions about how the patient's feeling or to have them rehearse the medication um, details, I can imagine getting instruction on how to do it and then feeling more frustrated. Um, I could also feel frustration. Um, as like a sociopath, uh, you know, being taught these empathic right. skills and just being like, well, this is stupid, I'm here to make money and uh, I don't care. So I wonder, you know, in, in those two extremes, how you balance those two extremes? Because um, I imagine they're very, they're very similar in presentation but different in ideology. <laughs> it's such a great question. Um, yeah, so let's talk about them separately, obviously, because uh, they look the same but they're obviously not. So the issue around, um, do I have time to do this, you know, or is it just too, the clinic too busy, is it's really complex and it varies from country to country and clinic to clinic and, and provider to provider. So, and I think there's a variety of possibilities. I think at least in this country, uh, where we're not seeing, a, you, so let me go back. In Ethiopia, you may be seeing 60 patients in a half a day or 70 or 80. So kind of, let's put that aside for a moment and get back to it. But in a country like here, where you're seeing maybe, you know, a, a considerably smaller number than that, I think uh, it's often a question of uh, uh, that the not enough time is kind of an excuse for not being empathic. And uh, one can learn how to do this in just a short period of time. You can take those same 8, 12, 15, 20 minutes and turn it into an empathic experience. That I know for a fact. So I think that... Uh, you have to sort of judge, is this an excuse or is this is the reality? If it's uh, 60 or 80 patients a day, you have to work within that framework, unfortunately. And you have to try to fashion things that are, that are possible within the framework. It may just be the doctor should introduce him or herself and uh, call the patient by their name and apologize for the wait. You know, it may be something so simple that it'll at least move things in a better direction. So that's that. The sociopaths... Um, <laughs> It's a tough one. I, I, I think they're fortunately in a small minority uh, in the whole society and in medicine. Uh, I think there are some people who just don't want to do this at all because it's not in their heart. But I, I, I like to believe, and my experience has sort of confirmed, that um, most providers want to do this well and don't, don't know how and are frustrated. And at the end of the day, if they don't do it well, the level of burnout and frustration is even higher. So I think given the right skills, uh, most providers kind of thrive and appreciate uh, learning. That's just what I've seen after 20-odd years of, of teaching this stuff. 
Yeah. Well, I'd kind of like to riff on his question a little bit. Yeah. I've been a healthcare worker for about 10 years. And I don't think it's a dearth of empathy that we're lacking or seeing, at least in my experience, even though these horror situations definitely happen in the hospital every day. But I can't help but think that maybe it's the system because it's based on profit. It's business oriented that that is sociopathic. And that is ultimately <laughs> going to be our problem, even if we train empathic providers. If they're working within a system that sees patients as commodities, yeah. it doesn't look at the right to human health, and we'll have a kind of gentler, capitalistic, yeah. business oriented healthcare system, but we'll still be leading people down towards poor health outcomes, no insurance, not access to right. medications, things like that. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. Um, I, 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 um, I'm not sure how to res I agree and I'm not sure how to respond. Um, <laughs> yeah, how to respond. But I think we have this obligation. We have an obligation to look at the big picture and to do what we can to change it. And the big picture is a mess right now and in so many ways. So there's no question in my mind that that's fundamental. And various people have different ways of doing that. And, uh, that's, and that's a whole conversation that's definitely worth having. And then we have to look at the situation of what do we do day to day in the confines of our work? And how do we make it as good as we can for as many people as we can? And I, I can't do one or the other. I have to find a way to do both. And I, and I wouldn't be happy trying to do one. It's just putting Band-Aids on things. But if you just do the other and you, and you have a job where you're, actually, where you're actually required to take care of patients and their families, you have to do it in as, as caring and as, in a way as you possibly can. And so. It's like yes and. That's what I see. Yeah. Um, I have a measurement question. I'm wondering if uh -oh. you sorry, switch, switching gears. No, please. I'm wondering if you found a good way to kind of measure how and whether this kind of trickles into practice. Yeah. Um, kind of in the more medium and long term. Um, and I guess then, you know, outcomes, but like yeah. kind of whether it really does influence practice. There's a lot of social desirability and there's probably uh, observer effects, right? Or if they feel like they're being watched, it changes. Everything. The measurement is really difficult. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and there are even more reasons why it's difficult, mm -hmm. including the fact that expectations are so low. Mm -hmm. So you can't go by patient satisfaction, <coughs> because many women can't imagine anything better because they've never seen it. So then where does that leave us? Yeah. Um, our hope with this project is to measure the two things that are very measurable, which is privacy and birth companion. The piece about measuring the impact of our communication skills teaching is 10 times more difficult. And it would require a really intensive effort to look at, uh, you know, to do patient interviews in a meaningful way, uh, which is not easy, and uh, to look at outcomes in a meaningful way, which is even more difficult. So you're, you've identified a good problem. I'll be very happy if we can publish a paper that shows improvement in privacy and birth companions and how we got there. Because that'll be... That'll be much better than what's out there already, which is next to nothing. Sounds so that's important. sort of that's where I am. Yeah. Um, my question is kind of about um, clearly through like the work you're doing, um, you're trying to respect local culture and make, and understanding that every health situation is context specific. But since um, you are still coming in as kind of like a Western doctor. Um, in these lower to middle income countries, how do you um, basically ethically understand and and mediate um, the you know history of these countries and how that possibly could play a role in how how much um, these healthcare centers are accepted by the community and things like that? Yeah, the question is, as an outsider coming in, and uh, how do you deal with the issue, the political realities of the country? how people see the government and the health system. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It's not, it's, it's incredibly hard. And I, I, you know, I, I sort of like, uh, I don't have an easy answer. I have some, I have some thoughts. Mm -hmm. First of all, I think this whole, um, we had another hour, I'd love to talk about cultural humility mm -hmm. as a concept. Because we're taught about cultural competence all the time, which to me is unattainable. But the notion of cultural humility, which is like lifelong learning about the places we find ourselves, is just critical to our well-being and the well-being of the world. So it's easier said than done, but I think 
that's the attitude that one, and I don't model it myself as well as I'd like to, but that's the attitude that one would like to encourage to do this work. In terms of the politics, uh, in, I'll give you, in Ethiopia, it's, it's, it's horrible sometimes to do this work in the context of the political situation. Because the last time, uh, when I was there a year ago, I was in the region that had been most uh, victimized by the government. And there were more political prisoners in Aromia than anywhere else in the country. And everybody had a family member who was, kill who was killed, or many people did. And it was completely unthinkable to talk about it, because you just can't, because it's it would be dangerous. So you have to kind of, you still want to do good in the world, but you're in this unfortunate situation of trying to temporarily make believe it's not happening. And it's, very, and it's a very uncomfortable feeling. I'm not, I'm not, I was never pleased with that. Fortunately, there's a new president. All the political prisoners have been freed, and things are changing so quickly. So in some ways, I, uh, that took me off the hook. But it's, you know, you can't go into global health thinking it's going to be like, uh, you know, imagining that's not going to happen. It's, it's happening all the time. And we have to just be sensitive and aware, and, and we'll still make mistakes. I guess we should finish up. You yeah, share your video? I'd, I'd love to this time, yeah? Um, so, my name is Godfrey, I'm from Tanzania. Um, I was kind of uh, interested to know how did you guys try to help this uh, medical student to deal with the pleasure, pleasure of seeing a lot of patients at the same time maintain the integrity and the ethics. I can kind of remember when I was an intern, working the whole night and then the whole day, and at the end of the day you have this mama, she's trying to ask you all these important questions. Yeah. Why should we do that and this? You know, it's uh, it's important them those investigations they have to be done, but you don't have any longer like any ability to answer all the questions. Yeah. It's, it, 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 yeah, it's grueling work. It's so exhausting, and I've seen exactly what you're describing. And there's no uh, there needs to be you know in the long run needs to be a combination of structural change so nobody's working those inhumane hours and expected to give care. And then change so when you ha when one has the ability, one can actually uh, do something with the time. But uh, you're right. I, there are certain situations where these, this would be absurd. If you're like work 36 hours and you have like uh, and and now somebody has so many difficult questions. Just, as much as you want to, you can't summon the energy. So th those are all realities. That there's no simple answer. We all just do what we can in the world and, and hope. Let me show you, if you have three more minutes, I'd love for you to stay to see something more. So another project that, I'm, that we're working on that is very unrelated to, um, to this, but related to some of the same concepts, is called Keepers of the House. And Keepers of the House is funded by the Duke Health Humanities Lab and also uh, Duke Ahead and the Trent Foundation. And it's a curriculum for medical students, doctors, nurses, all different healthcare professions about the human relationships between housekeepers at the hospital and patients and their families. Because we discovered, discovered, we noticed that there's an incredible connection that happens between housekeepers and patients. And it goes un, it goes unnoticed by the entire rest of the healthcare team. And we saw situations where, where housekeepers were singing to the patients, praying with the patients, maintaining friendships after the patients go home. So we've, uh, this is our team up there, and we've created 10 uh, videos of uh, housekeepers telling their stories. And we're going to be assembling this into a film in the spring and hope to make it into a curriculum in, in a national curriculum in medical schools. That's my goal. So let me just show you a two minute, uh, sort of ex not, it's not an excerpt because we're using different footage, but a kind of a teaser about what the film might be like. And then we'll be, then we'll be done. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kimberly McRae, and I'm a housekeeper at Duke North. And I've been working for housekeeping for four years now. I started in May 2013. If you're a housekeeper like me, I have 32 rooms every day. We do two discharges. We clean 32 rooms, our staff bathrooms. So I expect cooperation as a teamwork. I help the patients by interacting with them with a smile, greeting them, even though you might know they're going through pain or suffering, or they might just be a little grumpy because of 
what the situation is, you know. So if you go in there with good spirits and a smile, that kind of is a small light to say, but there is hope. The floor I work on, which is just a 300, I don't have a lot of patients that were cold. So when they do cold, it, they immediately take them to the ICU, but I never see them again. I had one um, family who I got real close to. It was two daughters and the mom was the patient. And the mom, that was just so sweet. So you know how when a patient cold, I seen the daughters cry, so it made me cry. You know, I'm like, oh my God, that's so sweet and a beautiful family. And the mom was just chipper, you know. So I had to leave the floor. I left for a little while, I went on break early, I told my manager and everything. And when I walked off and I came back, I didn't see him no more. So two days after their departure, I was leaving work, getting up, and the daughter ran up to me. And she said, oh my God, Kim, Kim, I didn't know. Um, we're still here. So I'm like, I thought y'all was gone. She said, no, Mom had to go to the ICU. So I asked how she was doing, of course. She said, well, she's doing better. She's back awake and stuff. And she said, Kim, oh my God. She said, we miss you. Housekeeping can be very touchy. And I'm pretty sure we all have hearts. So you're going to cry. If you're a housekeeper that cares, you're going to cry. Especially if you get close to your patients. And like my floor, some of my patients stay a little while. So, of course, if they stay longer than a week, you're basically family. So, you're going to get close to them. And they're going to want to conversate. And you're going to know each other. Might not know your whole history, but you're going to know things about one another. So, that's one major thing about housekeeping. You have to have a strong mind and a strong heart. Because it will break you down to your knees sometimes. And I'm pretty sure the doctors and stuff, you know, cry also. But it's kind of different when you actually have to be in there and hear them, you know. And, and like I say, even though doctors and nurses is in and out, but sometimes the housekeeper might stay in a little longer than the doctor have to stay. So they doing all that thing to us. But... We just have to keep them encouraged and keep them looking on the bright side because you can't stay down forever. Okay. So we'll stop there. Um, we covered a lot of territory. Thank you all for your attention. And the film you'll see in the spring is uh, coming soon. Uh -huh. <laughs>